Hello, welcome to the very first episode of Against Gravity. I'm your host, Henry Durban. Think of it this way. So gravity is any force that sort of pulls an object towards the earth, right? Yeah, so gravity could be any factor that pulls you back towards your goal. Any challenge, any hurdle. But to actually achieve something great, you need to go against gravity. And yes, that's the basis for this podcast. We are going to speak to game changers, creators, creatives, and business leaders who have gone against gravity, faced a lot of challenges and hurdles, but they didn't give up. They pulled through, and today, they can celebrate their success and wins. Against Gravity is a podcast conversation that comes to you every two weeks and it is produced and powered by Pisha, an Afrocentric visual content provider. Now let's go straight to our very first guest on Against Gravity. He is Bernard Kafui Supe. Bernard is known widely in the creative community in Ghana and Africa as the brand Meister. He's an astute marketing professional, you know, tested and tried with a decade of experience in branding and marketing for companies that are in the sectors of telecom, e-commerce, and tech. He's been very instrumental in successful campaigns for big brands like Vodafone, Tigo, Tornaton, and Unilever, you know Vodafone X and you know Bloomberg, these are like really memorable brands if you live in Ghana or even in Africa and beyond. Yes, he's been one of the leaders of the branding and marketing of these iconic brands. So let's go straight to our interview with him. Thank you so much for speaking to us on Against Gravity. Thank you very much, Henry. The name Mr. Meister. (laughs) <laughs> What's it about? Oh my goodness. I just really liked the band. And the band, when the band was at his peak, then he was called Coco Master. So I remember when I was setting up my Twitter um, handle, it was called Coco Master One or something like that. Coco Master One. And then after a while, I removed the one and I just made it Coco Master. Then, um, I think it eventually became Coco Meister. Oh. Because it, I felt it wasn't original enough and I'm, I'm, I'm big on originality, so I'm like, okay. I love this name so much, but there's so many Coco Masters around online, I have to always put a number behind it. Mm. So I said I made a Coco Meister so that it would just sound like mm-hmm. something that I own. And then when it was Coco Meister for a while, then some years later so then I just changed to the Meister. And then finally Mr. Meister. Oh. And uh, Mr. Meister, um <laughs> when I started working in music, um when people see me, because the name was The Meister, they just started calling me, hey, Mr. Hey, Mr. Meister, hey, Mr. Meister, no. and then, I'm like, okay, yeah, but why is it, everyone's calling Mr. Meister, why don't I, it sounds, it's, it's a nice ring to it, so why don't I change it to Mr. Meister, and I also decided to check on the meaning of Meister, and um, it's, it meant someone who is really good at what he does, so I'm like, well, it looks like this name is destined to be, um, how do you call it, my, my nickname. So, yeah, then I named my company Brand Meister, and it fit perfectly. Um, it was Meister Music, and, um, and I'm working on a couple of other things now. So <laughs> Meister. With Meister. Yeah, but yeah, it's, it's fit, it fit perfectly, and... As the, st- the stars will align, it's, it has come to stay and mm. become like what I'm known for. On your Twitter bio, you describe yourself as a doer and a dreamer. But how would you describe yourself to a 20-year-old who is Mr. Meister? I'm a brand enthusiast and a marketing professional. And so there, I remember there was a time that... Um, 
I was going to speak somewhere, social media week, and they put out my bio, and there were people who were following me then because I was working with an artist, and they were surprised that, like, I've worked here, I've done this, I'm professional in this, I do e-commerce, I do that, like, they were blown away, like, what, you, same guy, like, and, um, so when he said, oh, what would I, how would I explain myself to this 20-year-old and he said music, I just, I'm just saying this to clarify that, um, <clears throat> there's so many things that I've done, so that's what, I, I have different personalities, but I call myself a dreamer and a doer because, um, there are lots of people who dream, lots of people who have ideas, and uh, if you see my bio too, I say that ideas, ideas are shit, but execution is what it is. So, like, why you have so many ideas and you're not acting on it? People don't buy. It. Everyone has ideas. As you see, you have so many ideas to do things. Maybe something is preventing you from doing it. it could be money. It could be just know how. He's sitting there has so many ideas. And everyone has ideas, so um, I believe in people who dream and also do. You understand? There are more dreamers and doers as it stands now. So if I meet a 20 year old, I'm just going to tell him that I am a dreamer and I'm a doer. That's, that's basically what I am. As a master, I think I want to go back to growing up. Okay. I mean, I've seen how a storied career you built in brand marketing but growing up as a young person what little things do you do you feel influenced your creative life today it's so interesting i really get people like asking me about my when i was growing up so many things um so growing up i was i have very bad attention i can't I can't multitask, that's one. <laughs> and um, I'm only interested in things that interest me. Um, I don't know, people call it ADHD. I've not really checked to see if, but I think I, I'm a bit on that spectrum. Um, so, growing up, obviously, the things that interest me is what I will be so good on in school. Like, I love arts. Like visual art, I like I, I can draw, I can actually illustrate. Um, I love entertainment, so creative arts. I used to do spelling bee, creative writing. Um, those are the things that interested me. So I grew up like I remember my my mom used to even really get upset because every book she gives me, I will draw everywhere on the book. Like book that I'm supposed to submit for homework. It is not if it's a math related course, but then the, the teacher will open it and I've drawn I've drawn stuff inside it and you call my mom and be like, what's wrong with this kid? <laughs> so she even started banning me in the house from touching pencils and stuff like I imagine. But after a while she just accepted that see this guy, this is what he loves. I hated math, I'm not very analytical. I've found a way to adapt to it in my working life, but I'm not the someone who would like mm-hmm. numbers. Um, so even I went to Presec doing visual arts and basically in summary all my life uh, people have people around me have made it made me feel like um, me doing art um, like I mean there's nothing I can do yeah. for myself in the future. When I was doing um, in I was doing visual arts, sculpture. They always used to say that, oh, every day I'm molding clay, I'm playing with clay, you can't uh, write the computer. What are you going to be in the future? They'd just be laughing at me because they just assume that oh, mm. if you're not doing science or you're not doing business, mm. and research, you know, be students. And what is the impact of that? Undermining visual arts, undermining the art as a country, I think it has seeped into even how people appreciate creative work and even pay for it yes um, yeah and that's why people don't respect the arts here and it, it takes if you notice a lot of the creative people making it big the or people when people start respecting them they have some maybe a foreign body will come and maybe pay someone commission someone to do some projects 
or something and then the now people will start um, respecting them but also social media has um, social media and digital media has really shown the impact of art mm -hmm. so if you notice that there are more creatives at first, at first when I was in uni and I, I did communication design in uni I did that graphic design and my dream was to come out as a graphic designer so even then when you're looking for agencies to do your internship it was really really hard because there were not a lot of them you could count them the uh, what do they call it so cbwa marcom uh, what do they call it low Lintas. Mm -hmm. there were not a lot of them you understand uh, mmrs there were not a lot and you you we knew all of them like we had a sheet a lecturers would call send all of them letters but now you you can't even count the number of creative agencies mm -hmm. in the country. Digital agencies, create, uh, advertising agencies, there's so many of them, so many. It's not a bad thing, it's good that um, people are expanding into that and maybe makes the space more fine. Even though a lot of them, some of them, um, some of these agencies um, are just into it because well, they were led into it because they're trying to be hustling. Um, they, 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 they mess it up for some people who can actually do the work because I can't imagine a number, count the number of times I've gone to a client and the client has said, oh, that's for marketing there, we are not interested, we don't want to do any creative work. And the last agency that came collected so much money and didn't do anything. And then it's just spoiling the market for other people who want to really do the work. When I was in Presec, I thought I was going to be a sculptor. <laughs> <laughs> so I used to really do well with sculpture, like clay work and stuff. And when I finished, I went to do com design. Now I said, okay, I'm going to be a graphic designer. So I came out of school as a graphic designer, started my career as a graphic designer mm -hmm. at an ad agency. Um, I was doing graphic design there. Then I started doing copywriting. And then I started doing client service. And then I moved to the client side, I was for the phone camera. Then I started doing digital and then did some customer loyalty to help me with my numbers. Then I did youth markets and like that. And then went on and on. So every time I was looking for the next the next high thing. I was not that designer that okay, I'm a designer, that's it. I'm gonna be a designer for the next twenty years, no. Hmm. I, and as it stands now, I keep looking for what's next. What's the next thing I can do? You know what I mean? Right now, uh, my long-term vision was own my own agency. Yeah, yeah, my own my own agency. So I feel like, okay, what next? What's the next um, point of goal? So um, I've just been thinking of new things and always trying to create impact. Mm -hmm. You've worked with some creative and corporate agencies, uh, Sachi and Sachi, Echo House, Vodafone, Tornaton. But at Vodafone, you won the Heroes Award at a point. Yeah. What was your impact there? So, um, I won two Heroes Awards actually. One is a local Hero Award and one is a global Hero. Uh, the Hero Award is just basically an award that they give to people who perform exceptionally well in their field. Mm. Um, I joined Vodafone at a time where they were... A lot of businesses in Ghana did not even know how to approach the social media thing. They just knew that, okay, everyone is on Facebook, how do we also get there? People were just posting, no, no strategy, nothing. I, I, I dare to say that I was like one of the first people who was actually doing digital with like strategy because when I was in the agency, uh, the agency was handling Tigo. It was a Guatemalan agency called 4AM Sachi. The okay. main agency was called 4AM Creation. And it was partnered with Sachi and Sachi in Guatemala, and then they formed for him Sachi here in Ghana. Now, even then at the agency, when we handled Tigo, Tigo didn't even really have social media pages. That's how bad it was. So the agency was the first to work on Tigo's social media page, and that is where I got the interest and learned it. So when I was going into Vodafone, I went with that experience to now go and set up Vodafone's own too. So it it was it was a very it was very early time. People had no idea how to tackle social media. The brands were just posting, making mistakes, 
and because I've learned from these guys from Latin America and done some experience on the Tigo account, it helped me uh, work on the Vodafone one. And I did so well because they have been struggling to even grow the page, get likes, um, reach, all those things. And then I came with that whole mm. proper tactic and everything to show them how it was. And we reached 100,000 followers. 100,000 likes on the Facebook page in about four months of me joining, or five months, and that's what basically got me the uh, Vodafone Euro Award. The second one was for youth marketing. The business had been trying to do youth marketing for a while, but it seemed very potential because you know young people like to like things that feel like it's theirs. They don't want you to just do an artwork and then put some young people on there and say, hey, this is cool. Like, it looks like an old man who is wearing worn skin jeans and stuff and is trying to mingle with young people. Mm -hmm. um, so they could see through the, sorry to say, the bullshit, but it didn't seem authentic to them. So my job on Vodafone X was to create something that was um, authentic and youth-led. So uh, building Vodafone X, we had to engage young people. We created a whole insights group called the Red Lab, uh, which was fully students. And these students, all they do was they come in house to Vodafone every week. We give them a room. They brainstorm and they just try and create their dream telco by brainstorming and present to us. And in the in the process of having the fun, we are gathering the insights. So as they are playing, having fun, presenting to us, we are picking what they like. Because it's hard to get into the mind of people when you don't actually hear from them in a very relaxed place. So someone is telling you his dream telco, he's telling you, I want a telecom company that has, that I don't have to pay for data, that my social media is unlimited, that's my, you get what I mean? So those insights led us to, all right, data is big for them, they don't want to have to pay for data, they don't even have the money like that. Um, they, they, can, they spend money though, but they don't, it's hard for them to spend money on data like that, so their brother is just there. Or how do we get them to spend for data without realizing they're spending for data? Mm -hmm. So then we created Vodafone X as a movement, and then we introduced the SIM card after the movement had been launched for a while. So now they felt like, oh, you created a movement for us, you're doing parties for us, you're taking us to the movies. And then they are telling us we have a SIM card that's just for us, we we'll all buy it and then we all bought it. And then now it became like it, the subscription was really high, we're doing concerts, we give them unlimited data, which was obviously capped, but because of we've monitored their usage, we know that let's say you don't exceed 8 gig in a month, so we've done it exactly to that point and then when it reaches that point, um, it will either start um, slowing down and then you have to top up or something. So it was a successful thing. Uh, MTN followed suit to do all. Tigo followed suit to do Tribe, we did last. Ethel followed suit to do Flex, we did last. I think we'll try something too, but yeah. MTN has been successful as well because they have the numbers, they have the um, infrastructure, they have the revenue, and the Capital, so obviously, but yeah, that's another reason I got the Global Hero Award because it was, um, it was, uh, how do you call it, noticed by the group and um, other markets like um, other uh, the Malta and Egypt started following. Going from Egypt started following suits. Hey, Seta. From what you say, I think that's my best description of you. <laughs> people have people have done better than I did. So. <laughs> now, but we've done our own too. <laughs> now let's move to Meister Music. I know you managed Mr. Easy to become a global music sensation when it comes to Afro beats. How did you get to work together with Mr. Easy? Um, well, that was an interesting face in my life. Um, he's an old friend of mine, very good old friend of mine. KNSC together, I was doing events for Ghanaians, he was doing events for Nigerians, and that's how we became friends. Uh, fast forward from that, 
I, I was working in Vodafone doing marketing, excelling in the area of marketing. Um, he, he was also doing his music and doing, pursuing other things like business. And yeah, so we met again. Um, he asked for my services as a marketing person to assist him with his, with his brand and, and his music. So I started working on it with him. Uh, I would say it was successful. It blew up. Uh, uh, we built. Uh, I created a because I'm very like professional and everything. I created a, a business or a brand out of it. Now with Master Music, uh, mainly focus on managing and building the brand and everything around it. It's, uh, it's successful. Well, I think I was here for like, four years. Successful four years, and uh, we parted ways to move on to other things. So. Mm. That was basically what it is. But it was a very interesting time. I learned a lot, built a good network, and challenged myself to do something that I've never done before. Now let's come to the brand Meister. Yeah. You've been running this brand for about three years now? Yeah, this year three. Yeah. This month you celebrated your third anniversary. Mm-hmm. And looking back over the last three years, how has the brand Meister been for you? How has what? How has the brand mindset as an agency been? Been. First year was amazing because everyone was keen on working with me because I've been in corporate so long. All the people who wanted to work with me, I kept brushing them off because I was focused on my corporate life. Um, year two got tough at a point. Um, one, because maybe I was not fully around, even though five my partners are the most competent people ever. But a lot of people just had that perception that my star has to be in town for things to happen. You understand? But yeah, I even think that we did one of some of the most amazing things in my absence, like Jameson Connect, um, Live Wired was launched in my absence, and. Uh, that was my team. Like Where were you then? Partners. I was like, you could do my masters. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, okay, that was a bit of the first year, the second year. And then um, we had COVID. <laughs> COVID to came to slow us down. So, yeah, we are now in our, we just completed our third year. And um, the third year was a tough one, the very tough one, yeah. Because of COVID, and we bounced back and we survived it. We still have our team, and we expanded a bit. And we we give birth to Ripple Influence, um, and we are giving birth to two other projects which we will be here of soon. Um, yeah, so it's been great. It's been exciting, mm. and we are only going up. You describe the pandemic as a grueling time navigating it uh, for you how has it changed your outlook on work and life um <laughs> the pandemic has just made me see that there's nothing too urgent <laughs> yeah it's true there's nothing too urgent we kill ourselves too much saying uh, like i mean there's you i have had covid before i had covid like in, in, in end of last year and it just taught me that it's a hum- it's a humbling thing. Like you can be the most busy person, but now you have to quarantine and sit in the house and then not go anywhere and just focus on your health. And it's not just COVID, any sickness at all. So I just say that um, it's a humbling it's a humbling thing. It's a, it's a leveler. It picks everybody equal. Forget, forget what you have. If there's a pandemic, everybody thinking about their lives. Even luxury brands stop producing luxury stuff because everybody's trying to survive. Um, yeah, it's just been very humbling mm-hmm. period, and um, I've, I'm taking life more easy. I don't stress myself too much now. Um, when something when something can be done. I can't deliver something to a client. I mean, like, I'll tell you the truth that maybe you are pushing too hard and I don't think my team can, can 
eat it, so maybe you should proceed with someone else. And then I get my peace of mind. It allows me to regroup and uh, do better next time or even prepare for the next class. This is Against Gravity with Henry Devon. Today we are speaking to Mr. Meister. He's a brand strategist with over 10 years experience working across event, brand marketing, and now influencer marketing. We're just entering his life, uh, challenges as he talks us about his career. And now I want to go to Bloomberg. For those who don't know Bloomberg, Bloomberg is Ghana's, I think, most patronized nightlife sport. It's a bar. Um, it gives you a bit of a nightclub feel, but it's not actually a nightclub because it's an open space type of place. Bloomba has been, you know, one of the most consistent bars in the past three to four years. You have been credited with that because of the brand marketing and the edge you gave to Bloomba. I mean, what do you think worked when it comes to the Bloomba success story from your perspective? Okay. Um, the owners of Lumba are amazing, creative, uh, relentless, enterprising young men. Um, I think the collaboration was a good match. Um, we working with them, my team working with them, and that is what made Lumba successful. It's not just me, obviously, not me. I don't want how well I marketed it. But I don't own the business. I, I just helped them achieve their dreams and I think um, we met at a good time, you understand? So, um, yeah, I think we, we, there was a lot of insights that we, we, we considered when we were doing the strategy for Mumba. And that is just how we work for everybody. We believe that you don't just think of cool ideas because they are cool. You think of ideas that really work. And that's why sometimes people will come here and just see a very simple, straightforward marketing strategy and they, they will be like, there was a client that said, after we presented to the client, the client was like, no, I'm looking for an agency. I'm looking for a creative agency. I'm not looking for just any agency. And we were confused and he says, our, our strategy doesn't look creative to him. And I said, because our strategy is very led by insight and we can present to you the most fluffy, hot air balloon flying over the Pacific kind of idea, but that is not what's going to give you what you said you wanted. We have to convince people and change people's mindsets over time. And the best way to go is with this approach we are showing you and he didn't understand. We eventually worked for his competitor, applied the same similar strategy, and the competitor beat him in market share. Later on, he came back not understanding. When he found out it was us, he was confused. But then we said, bro, we offered you the same thing. You thought it wasn't creative enough. You went to meet some other guys who did a really fun, cool, creative thing that created a buzz and then Created, sorry, hype mm. and then uh, reduced. But then we created something that built a buzz that lasted over time. You get what I mean? So um, I think with the Bloomberg thing, it was a lot of insights, a lot of research, uh, and a lot of um, future thinking, thinking about the future. Yeah. Um, I'm very future led. I like to think about what happened. Now you've launched Ripple Influence. Is that a standalone agency or is it under the brand Meister? So, um, brand Meister, um, in, our, in our work, initially we positioned ourselves as consultants. Um, right now we're just a full, uh, full service brand agency. And in our work, we ended up getting lots of influencer marketing projects or using influencer marketing in our projects and then it was so successful like what we did with Sugar Cup Beach Resort and people now started bringing out lots of influencer projects now it started, we started feeling like oh, um, it's, it's, it's diluting what we 
we are doing and at the same time to we identified a big gap in the influencer marketing space plenty things are wrong with the space how influencers are found the kind of content influencers create there's some people who have lots of following and reach and engagement but then are not creating the right content so we said you know what why don't we recreate something that is specifically dedicated to helping these influencers helping them create content helping them make more money helping them um, build careers for themselves and most importantly helping them make change with their Influence. You describe Ripple Influence as an artificial intelligence platform mm -hmm. uh, that is looking at, you know, connecting influencers to brands and to ensuring that you bring value to them. How are you using AI? AI, what we use AI for Ripple Influences, it monitors the, their behavior online. So you see how manually, well, when we're first engaged to find influencers, we manually go and check these influencers and some of them have to even request that, hey, please, can you send me an insight of your page? And it's just a lot of work. Some will even mind you because it's very intrusive. But the AI, all the AI does is that it checks and scans their behavior online. How, what posts are performing well for them, uh, how many people are they reaching on their interests. So a client comes and says, uh, or goes to the platform and says, hey, uh, I'm looking for uh, female influencers in uh, maybe uh, in East Africa uh, who have uh, this number of followers who are interested in maybe food and lifestyle. You get what I mean? Keying all those things in the platform will pick those things together, do a proper scan, the whole algorithm thing, and then come back to the results and say these five influence, influencers are the top five influencers that fits what you are asking for. Great. And you also say it has the goal of curbing youth and unemployment in yes. Africa and to create three million US dollars worth of influencer jobs by 2021. That's okay. ambitious, <laughs> Mr. Meister. Very, very, very ambitious, I know. How it's, do you plan on achieving that? It? <laughs> it's been very tough. Um, it's not as easy as it seems, but we were gauging the kind of money we have created for influencers in the past two years, working manually, and now we are gauging the reach we are about to have or we are having now with the platform and the ease in which we use it to create, um, get influencers for clients and um, that's made us do that estimate because that would mean we are working three times more than what we, we are making now and that's at that pace and the growth that we projected we will be able to create that number of uh, that amount of money for influencers over the period so very ambitious we are still very far behind our target but uh, we are in good conversations with big players um, we were in conversation with Trilla uh, which we did some work for them in East Africa and it's opening more doors for us so it's it's definitely has potential for us to reach our target if things go as planned. Yeah. There have been a number of criticisms against influencer marketing and top of my head the very first I know is influencers don't really add up to sales. You, you, they post things but people don't really come to my pay to buy. I just also say it's a fad, it's going to phase out very soon. The third is, what if the influencer has scandals, it affects your brand. Yeah. How do you respond to these? Hmm. There's so many things wrong with the industry. Um, yeah, scandals is a big thing. I don't want to mention something, but today I saw uh, a very big influencer in Ghana who was having issues with the police. And over a period, I've been ranting, in, like ranting online seriously uh, and acting really um, out of line. And I'm really worried about the brands that are working with that influencer. So those are things that can happen, right? And a lot of it you cannot control, but you need to do your background checks, check the influencer, um, monitor what, inf what kind of thing the influencer posts, and see if it is wholesome or in line with your brand. Um, what was the other thing you mentioned about? The sales, they don't really push sales. Yeah, some of them too. 
um, have a lot of followers, but because maybe they might have bought their followers, or they don't even write the right captions or create the right content. Content is everything. So two people with even the same followers, or someone with even less, can post one same content, but then you see that the person with less followers got more uh, interest and more people purchasing, and that is because maybe of how they crafted the message or the kind of people who follow them and yeah there's so many dynamics in influencer marketing mm. and it's actually a full-on science but people just think oh it's just our followers of influencer yeah. there are people who have lots of followers who post things and no one has them. <laughs> yeah there are people right. who have very like thousand followers and who post things and then they have like all 800 of the thousand followers patronizing them and that's real influence you are using analytics in your influencer marketing. What would you say are the top three things to watch when we talk about the future of influencer marketing? How will it change going forward? It's really interesting um, what you're saying because there is a threat in this industry in the sense that influencers have always had... The, re- the reason why influencer marketing is powerful is because they have control. It is, it is the people who have control of the industry. Um, they are the ones with the following, they are the ones with their own audience. But it looks like some of the big platforms or players, like the Instagram and the rest, seem to want to now take control of managing what, how to even contact influencers, or how to engage them and stuff um, like TikTok and the rest. They are all creating their own influencer platform um, side of the business. and. It, it defeats the purpose of why influencer marketing is what it is. There are becoming so many restrictions. Now you have to post to write an ad because they don't want people to mislead people. And um, that is one big thing that I, I have a, a problem with. That, that I mean, the whole idea of influencer marketing is that you are supposed to sneak up the idea of marketing or influence people without them even realizing you're influencing them. But now, when you are putting art in front of it before you influence them, it's like telling someone that, hey, I'm going to lie to you, I'm going to exaggerate to you right now, but then listen to me, then I still do it. Now it's like I've been told, so yeah, like, so now it has become like a, a status thing. An influencer putting art in front of their, their post is only making the influencer look like they are successful or they are working with a big brand. But it doesn't make the message that goes out to the people look authentic because now the audience knows that you were paid to say this. But fine, we still love you because brands are paying you. So that's why we like you, but we don't care about the message, we like you. You get what I mean? So now it comes back to a narcissistic uh, thing for the influencer, but not helping the brand in any way. But then so, the downside is people will also, you know, take money and act as if they are using a product when they don't. People use it and then there are side effects and then the influencer tries to distance them. So there have been a lot of issues. Yeah. That's why these policies are coming yeah, up. that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, I just think maybe at the point we'll come to a, we'll come to a way in which we can, um, we can, how do you call it, check this, right? Um, maybe people should, there should be another campaign that do, but what they don't want to go through that stress. Yeah. Maybe there should be a way in which you can check to see if it's, it's paid or it's not paid. Now, on this show, we have the against gravity moment because we believe against gravity is, you know, gravity is pulling you down. You are going against it. So your biggest against gravity moment is your most challenging project. It will have been your biggest failure. But you're able to move on from that. So what's your biggest against gravity moment? Or a campaign that you feel like it didn't work? I think my against gravity moment is it's a personal job I took that uh, didn't work out. And um, I would say the client, they had to let me go basically. And coming from such highs, like coming from companies that I had excelled and done amazing things, and then I eventually got into this company and well, the expectations of me was completely different from what I thought I was there for. And maybe if I knew what they were expecting of me, I wouldn't have taken a job. And you can't blame me on that because company was an Israeli company. There were, I think it's a miscommunication.
English and English. The job role and description was quite different from what I was expected to do. It's a very analytic role. I got into the role and I struggled for like eight months, like sleepless nights, crunching numbers. Whilst I initially came with so many cool ideas, ran away. And um, I ended up being in a role that, um, like I said, uh, uh, Numbers was my nemesis. And it's now that I'm a bit better and I've grown into it, but Numbers was my nemesis and I struggled. Like I struggled to eventually, they said, hey, like, we don't think this is a fit for you. Mm -hmm. You are amazing, you've done amazing stuff, but this is not where we want our business to go to at this point. So we think we have to let you go. And it really hits me hard. Yeah, I was depressed for a while. But I came out of it and it and that situation basically showed me where I should focus my strength. And from that day, when I started focusing my strength on what I am amazing at, it's been great. Now let's wind down and end the interview. I know you are, you know, big on Afro beats. When we go through your playlists, what are your top three most played songs today? Right now, there, there are so many good, <laughs> good guys out there. Um, I have Omale in my playlist. Um, I have, do you want a specific song? Or just yeah, a song will help so we, yeah. can, we can download it. This is free like marketing for them. Omale's Godly. Okay, Godly. Um, Good. I like Jackie. Oh, I can't remember the title of the song, but her newest song. Okay. Um, so, you mean the third one? Yeah. This is, so, we got such a big <laughs> fan of um, Army Huge. Really grown in his career, mm. and he has a song with the Chadman Kwame that I really like. Yeah, so Afrobeats for now, those three are my songs. Great. Uh, parting words to young people who are creators, creatives listening to the show, graphic designers, even into music who are trying to make it there. What are your words you're going to leave for them? Words that will ring in their ears and their heart as they work hard. I mean, to the um, life is short, so whatever they're doing, they should just do it. Stop waiting for find the right time. You no, know, they should just do it. Thank you so much for welcoming us into your office for this interesting conversation. Yeah. Thank you so much for this enlightening conversation, Mr. Bernard Kafui Sutbe also known as Mr. Meister. Thanks for opening the window into your life, your career, your struggles, and your work campaigns as well. To you listening, thank you for your time. Uh, my name is Henry Durbin. I'm your host. Also, this program is produced by Pisha, your Afrocentric visual content provider. Don't forget this podcast is available on this channel and every two weeks we bring you a different conversation that will change your life and leave you feeling empowered than before. I leave you with this quote, the bend in the road is not the end of the road. Thanks for listening. Have a good one.